Last Sunday, we began to study here lesson number four about relationship, not religion. Relationship, not religion, with the subtitle of the impossible Christian life. The point being that the Christian life is impossible for us to live apart from the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's not about us and our self-effort and our climbing a ladder to try to please God. It's all about understanding that if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you're born again, you're a child of God, you're part of His family, you've been accepted in the Beloved, accepted in Christ Jesus. And even after salvation, you're not jumping on a ladder to try to, to climb to, so that God will accept you uh, or love you more or something like that. God, God will never love you more than He loves you today. He'll never love you less than He loves you today. His love never changes for you. So let's get into this relationship, not religion. And uh, we'll review a little bit. And then we will uh, continue on with the lesson. Our text verses were Romans chapter 7, 14 to 25. Let's look at those again here together uh, this morning. Romans 7, 14 to 25. The Bible says, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would... That do I not, but what I hate, that do I. In other words, what he's saying is sometimes the things that in my spirit I don't want to do, I end up doing them. And the things in my spirit that I want to do, sometimes I fail to do them. And, and he admits, the great Apostle Paul admits to the struggle that there is at times between the new spiritual nature and the fact that he's, you know, still has a, has a flesh and so on that doesn't always want to do the things that uh, the Spirit of God would want uh, us to do. Verse 16 there. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me. The, in other words, the desire, the will to do the right thing, it's, it's there. It's in me. For to will is present with me. But how to perform that which is good, I find not. I, I struggle, he says. Uh, verse 19, for the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that, I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. For many people, the Christian life breaks apart or it falls apart when they begin to see it as a religion rather than a relationship. When they view Christianity as a religion instead of the relationship that God wants it to be. Many people believe the Christian life to just be a moral code. And I've got to live to, to this, this standard and so on. But it's so much better uh, than that. Uh, God wants you to be able to enter into a precious relationship with Him where the God in heaven, the Creator, becomes your Father and you become your child. Jesus Christ becomes your Savior, your Redeemer, but also your friend. Your friend. The Holy Spirit of God comes to indwell born-again believers and He's there to be your comforter. And He's there to uh, equip you and teach you and help you and, and grow you uh, by the, in the grace of God to become more like Christ over time. Will we be perfect overnight? No. Will we be perfect before we get to heaven? No. But God is very patient with us and working on us to help us to, to make us into what he would have for us to be. Religion is sometimes about behaving well for God. Sometimes it's about behaving well for others. Impressing others, what others might think of me. And that's not what God intends either. God intends for the Christian life to be about a relationship that you have with Him. It's not about performance. It's not a, it's not a system of performance-based acceptance and so on, or my trying to achieve this, or my trying to get the approval of so-and-so. No, it's, it's realizing that I have a wonderful relationship in Christ Jesus. Sadly, we said this last week, sometimes Christians, even after salvation, 
may move from a, from a, from a grace-based, faith-based salvation to thinking that they've got to uh, do certain works for God to accept them. They've got to do certain works uh, for, to, to stay out of trouble with God. And at some point in people's minds, God moves from becoming the Savior to the Sheriff. We move from being accepted to accused and thinking God's always accusing. It's not God who accuses us. The Bible teaches us that Satan is the accuser of the brethren. I, I love to think of it this way, that, you know, Satan could go before God and we, we know he can go in the presence of God. He did that. He did that in, in Job's case. I like to think that perhaps Satan could go before God and Satan could accuse and say, I know that Brian Johnston. I know that Raphael, I know that Paul Stokowski, they're a dirty, no good, worthless. I know some of the things they do, some of the things of their heart. That, that Brian Johnston thinks he's a pastor. He's a no good, wicked. How can you even accept him? How can you save him? And God can go and he can look at the record and say, well, say sorry, say that name again. Ah, okay. He can look it up and look under my name. And see that I've been absolutely justified. I've been declared righteous. I've been declared innocent in the sight of God. Uh, God has stamped on there not guilty. Why? Because when I was born again, when I put my faith in Jesus Christ as my personal Savior, I was justified. All my sins were washed away. The righteousness of Jesus Christ was imputed onto my account. And now when God sees me, he doesn't see me as the sinner that I am, the sinner that I was. He sees me as righteous. Why? Because my sins have been covered by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. He has washed me and made me clean. And that has nothing to do with me. And so I have nothing to boast in, nothing to glory in. It's only by the grace of God that we're saved. You see, Satan's the accuser, not, not Jesus. Not Jesus, and we certainly need to, need to remember that. We said last week, number one in our notes, about establishing a biblical framework. Some of you may be filling in the blanks if you weren't here last week or whatever. Want to do that. Number one, establishing a biblical framework. We need to learn to think biblically when it comes to, to Christianity. Think biblically. Have a biblical framework for our theology, for our doctrine. When you think of your Christian life, you need to start thinking relationship, not religion. You were not saved into a system. You were not saved by a structure. Christianity is not just some self-help program. You were saved by the Lord Jesus Christ. You're saved by, by Him. You were saved by a person. You were introduced to the Savior because you could not save yourself. And, and Christianity is about knowing Him and walking in close relationship with Him. It's about loving him and being loved by him you were born again into the family of god we become the children of god we become the sons of god letter a in your notes there write this the lens of religion the lens of religion now this isn't the correct way to view it but some people view christianity through the lens of religion to them, it's just a system of works, a system of things where they must merit something or, or earn something or achieve something. And that's not at all the way that God wants us uh, to view things. Some people are, are, are trying to, to climb a ladder to get closer to him, to be more accepted by him. They think that the higher they climb, the more they'll, they'll feel better about themselves, the closer they'll, they'll maybe feel to him. Each rung of the ladder will improve your self-effort and your personal discipline. With each higher step, you'll congratulate yourself for being more successful. With every failure, you may be hard, hard on yourself and think, oh, how could God possibly ever love me? And God doesn't want us to view the Christian life that way. Not at all. Not at all. That ladder concept is not in the Bible. That's a man-made thing. That's man-made ideas and thoughts and so on. It may deceive us into thinking that we can earn God's acceptance if we try hard enough. It may soothe our conscience at times when, when we're doing well, but then it will, will, will throw us to the ground in failure when, we, when we, we feel like we're not measuring up and so on. Another problem with that kind of ideology is that we'll build our own measure, measuring sticks. We could compare ourselves to somebody else or, or somebody on another ladder. And, wow, I'm doing pretty well compared to them. And God does not want us to, to at all be like that, of course. Second thing here is the lens of relationship. This is how we should view Christianity. This is how we should view the Christian life. Understand that it's a relationship. 
a relationship that we can enjoy. If you'll frame your Christianity through the lens of relationship, the biblical view, then the truth sets you free. The truth makes you free. God comes near to you. And he invites you into relationship with him. The climbing gives way to resting. The frustration gives way to forgiveness. Exhaustion gives way to renewal. And trying gives way to yielding. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, the Apostle Paul wrote, in the inspiration of God. And he is the one who can save us and make a difference in our life. Let's go on here to point number two in our notes. It's clarifying expectations. Clarifying expectations. Clarifying expectations. I love Philippians 1 and verse 6. I just skipped over it there. But Philippians 1 and verse 6 says, Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. It is God who saves us. It is not ourselves. We're saved by his mercy. We're saved by his grace. And he began a good work in me on the day when he saved me. Sometimes you don't always know the date necessarily, but for me, I, I, I look back at encounters and so on and things my family had and determined that it was June 24th, 1981, on a Sunday night at home when I accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. I believed on him and asked him to be my savior and I was born again and I became a child of God. He began a good work in me on that day and, and he still got a lot of work to do on me. <laughs> He's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. Took him just a week to make the moon and the stars. Sun and, uh, sun and the earth, however that song goes. Jupiter and Mars. He's still working on me, right? I understand that. I won't be perfectly like Christ, perfectly sanctified like him until I get to heaven. But he's, he's, he's performing a work. He's working on me to make me what I ought to be. Number two in our notes was this, clarifying expectations. Jesus told us that he came to give us an abundant life. An abundant life. In John chapter 10 and verse 10 it says, The thief cometh not before to steal and to kill and to destroy. That's Satan. He's the thief. He doesn't come to give you anything good. He comes to steal and to destroy. He's never helped a family. He's never helped a marriage. No, he, he steals and destroys and kills. The thief cometh not before to steal and to kill and to destroy. Jesus said, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. It's Christ that gives an abundant life. It's Christ that gives the blessed life. Sounds wonderful. The problem is that many times we don't understand what abundant life is and how it works. And our expectations may be a little bit flawed. Our expectations may be incorrect. Wrong expectations always leave us disappointed. They may end up leaving us in the Christian life feeling like an absolute failure. And so we need to be careful of our expectations. Letter A in our notes write this. What we expect from Jesus. What we expect from Jesus. Let me give you a few of our wrong expectations from Jesus. Or our wrong assumptions about the Christian life. What are some of the wrong, faulty assumptions that you and I sometimes have about what the abundant life should look like. What the Christian life should look at. One of those is happiness. Happiness. If you want to maybe write that in your notes, I don't know if it does it say it in there. If you want to just write it in there next to Psalm 1611, happiness. We may think wrongly, Christianity, becoming a Christian, that'll just make me happy all the time. I'll never have a problem. I'll never have a difficulty. All it brings is happiness. That's, that's, that's our, what we wrongly expect. Becoming a Christian should make us happy. And we fail to realize that joy, the joy God promises doesn't mean we'll never have pain or sorrow or hurt or difficulty in our life. God doesn't promise just happiness. He promises to give us joy. And there's a difference. You know where happiness comes from? Happiness comes from the, the happenstances of life, the circumstances of life. If my circumstances are good, I'll be happy. If my circumstances are bad, I'll be sad. Happiness can come and go with troubles and difficulties and so on, but God can give us joy through all times. And the Bible tells us this in Psalm 16, 11, Thou wilt show me the path of life in thy presence. In your presence, Jesus, in thy presence is fullness of joy at thy right hand. There are pleasures forevermore. 
What's another thing that maybe we wrongly assume will be ours all the time? Second thing there is peace. Peace. If you want to write that maybe next to this verse. And we may have the idea that we'll have this amazing rest. We'll never have problems. Because we may think a life of peace means no problems. But that's not true. Everybody will have problems. The difference is that God can give us peace in the midst of the problems. He can give us peace in the midst of the trials and the difficulties of life. The hardships, the struggles, the needy times. The Lord can give peace in the midst of problems. Peace is not the absence of problems, it's the presence of Christ. Peace is not the absence of problems in your life, it's the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ in your life. The Bible says in Philippians 4 and verse 7 there, And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. We may think of peace as being the absence of conflict or the absence of struggles, but peace is something, real peace is something that the Lord can give even when you do have struggles and difficulties. What's another thing? Forgiveness. Forgiveness. The knowledge that our sin debt has been fully paid. And what, what happens here is that we may sometimes presume that forgiveness will lead to immediate victory over sin. And some of you even today are struggling with that. You, you may think that, well, okay, I'm saved. And, you know, pastor tells me my sins are all forgiven. Why am I still having such a struggle with sin? You're, you're forgiven, but you're still going to, you're going to face some struggles. Because now that you're saved, you've got a spiritual nature that you never had before. You're still in this body of flesh and you'll have to live with it until you get to heaven. But now you've got a spiritual nature. You know what? That's why you, that's, that's why you struggle more with sin now than you ever did before you got saved. <laughs> because now that you're saved, the Spirit of God in you is reminding you of some things and trying to teach you some things. And, and sin bothers you now more than it did before you got saved. But praise God, we do have His forgiveness. But perfect sanctification and overcoming sin perfectly will not take place truly until we get to heaven. Should we, be, should we be sinning less after we get saved? Yes, we should. But we're not sinless. Right? And there's a difference. Should we sin less? Yes, we should sin less. But we're not sinless and perfect. What else? Uh, new life. Oh, sorry, Ephesians 1 there. I skipped that. Ephesians 1 says, In whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of His grace. Another little thought you could write there is new life. New life again. We may th and we do have new life in Christ, but we may think that we've got the magic eraser. We've got the magic fix for all of our problems. Everything is magically made better just because you got saved. Never a problem, never a trouble. It's going to be so much easier than the old life. Listen, everybody still has trials in life. Everybody will still experience sickness and pain and hurts and sorrows. And we live in a fallen world, a broken world, a sinful world. Will we be hurt at times? Yes, we will. Will we be offended at times? Yes, we will. We'll have struggles, we'll have hardship, we'll have trials, we'll have hurts and sorrow and pain and so on. First Corinthians says, but, sorry, but thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Sometimes we don't understand that happiness and pain can, can both coexist at the same time. We fail to see that peace doesn't remove the conflict, but it rises above the problems. We don't know that forgiveness of sin doesn't remove the struggle with sin that we'll, we'll still have. And our false assumptions set us up for big disappointment where we could maybe start to become disappointed with Jesus or disappointed with Christianity. And those are just wrong assumptions. Letter B in your notes there, write this. What we experience in Jesus. What we experience in Jesus. Shortly after salvation, there's this rude awakening to a struggle that we have and the burdens that maybe we didn't expect in this new life with Jesus Christ. 
And Paul describes it. The, the great apostle Paul, he describes it very clearly in his own life that there was a struggle. Notice what it says, Romans chapter 7 there, verses 14 to 19. The Bible says, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. For the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would, would not, that I do. Think about the conflict that the Apostle Paul describes for us. And every believer experiences the same thing. I experience it. BJ experiences is it. Raphael experiences. Uh, all of our experiences. Every one of us do. Every man, every lady will all experience a struggle because now we've got this new spiritual nature. We've still got this old flesh nature. It's like Paul's saying, I, I just can't get it all together. How I believe sometimes doesn't match up with how I end up behaving. I'm just a wretched man. Oh, wretched man that I am. It's like Paul saying, I'm a loser. <laughs> oh, wretched man that I am. The Christian life is going to be filled with conflict and tension. You know, we thought it might be perfect bliss, but we understand that we, we, we find that there's still some burdens. Here are a few of the paradoxes of the Christian life. Some of the uncomfortable realities that we experience every single day. First one there. Do they have, does it have this in your notes? I didn't, didn't remember. Joy plus hardness. Does it say that there? Does it say that? Just write it in there. Write just maybe above Hebrews or something. Write joy plus hardness. I didn't, I didn't take time to make slides for that. I should have. Joy plus hardness. Joy plus hardness. One of the paradoxes of the Christian life. You can have hardness and endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And yet God give you amazing joy through the difficulty. God still give you a joy in your heart. Being a Christian is more than hard. It brings with it hardness. It's not always comfortable. It's not always bliss. It's not always the, the paradise for which we hoped. Yet, yet, paradise is awaiting There'll be a life with no more pain, no more tears, no more problems once you get to heaven. But still, until then, you'll still have some pain. You'll still have some burdens. But the Lord wants to give you joy in the midst of that. Hebrews 10.32 says, But call to remembrance the former days in which after ye were illuminated, ye endured a great uh, fight of afflictions. Second one, if you want to write this, is peace plus conflict. Peace plus conflict. P-E-A-C-E, -E, peace plus conflict. You can be experiencing conflict, but still God give you peace. Peace plus conflict. Not long after following Jesus, the peace of God is clouded by the conflict of struggles. The Holy Spirit, through our conscience, begins convicting us of the needed change in our life and growth in our life. And suddenly there is this inner conflict, this turmoil. Spiritual nature, flesh nature. And our struggles with sin may seem to increase. There's no doubt about it. We will have more struggles with sin after we get saved than before we got saved. Because before we got saved, we did not care if we sinned. We were the servants of sin. And we did not have the Holy Spirit of God living in us. But once you make that decision to say, I believe that uh, Jesus died on the cross to be my Savior. I will admit to God I'm a sinner and I have no hope without Him. And you'll put your faith in Jesus and trust Jesus. And you're born again into God's family. God's Holy Spirit is going to come to dwell in you and live in you. And there will be a conflict then between the spiritual nature and the flesh. Peace plus conflict. The Bible says in Galatians, sorry, Galatians 5 there, verse 17, For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one, uh, one, the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. The next one there you can write maybe next to this verse is forgiveness plus failure. Maybe write the words forgiveness 
plus sign, forgiveness plus failure. We try and we fail. We try and fail and then our conscience condemns us. It isn't long before we feel guilt and shame over our sin. Our new birth makes us sensitive to failing and we become painfully aware of our sinfulness. We may sometimes feel like, feel like more of a failure, but praise God, we do have His forgiveness. We do have His forgiveness. I love 1 John chapter 1 because it's not written to the unsaved, it's written to believers. And he tells us there, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Romans 7 verse 19, For the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Here's another thought you can write down. Answers plus questions. Answers plus questions. You may sometimes feel like you've got even more questions. But God has the answers. Jesus has the answers. Becoming a Christian presents me with big answers to life. Where did I come from? Who made me? What's the purpose of life? Why am I here? Being willing to become a Christian gives you big answers in life. I don't know how many people I've talked to now. You know, especially I've talked to a number of Chinese people at times where because they were, many of them brought up under communism and taught to not even believe in God at all. With no concept of a God, no concept of, of the Creator and so on, sometimes they really have big questions like, what's the purpose of life? What's the meaning of life? You know what, when you finally come to know the truth and you'll accept Christ, you, so many answers we find. We find in God's Word. We find in the truth of Jesus Christ. We, we find in knowing who God is and who made us and so on. We find it when we're willing to put our faith in Him. That's why Hebrews 11, verse 6 is, is awesome. It says, but without faith, it's impossible to please Him. For he that cometh to God must believe that He is. Must believe that God exists, and so on. And that He's a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. It's amazing how so many answers can be found in life, but it takes a step of faith to find the truth. To many questions, God gives the answers now. To many questions, God waits and He won't give us the answers until we get to heaven. Some of you at times, you come with these struggles. You come with these questions. And, I just don't understand. God may not give you the answer until you get to heaven. Why does God allow such and such? Why does, why does God allow suffering in the world? Got to remember things. We live in a fallen, broken, sinful world. And all of that has consequences and it brings pain. Sometimes we like to blame God or question God. Why this? And why death? And why suffering? And so on. But it's the result of the fallen, broken, sinful world that we live in. 1 Corinthians, sorry, 13. And did it again. 1 Corinthians 13, 12 says this. For now we see through a glass darkly. But then face to face. Face to face with Jesus one day, you can get all the answers. For now, sometimes it's kind of like this morning, whether it was a foggy morning. Foggy morning, at least where I was driving. You know, so sometimes it's a glass darkly. Sometimes things are not real clear. Now I know in part, but then shall I know, even as also I am known. Does this describe your Christian life? I'm sure it does for many. Some of these struggles. Life is not always as perfect as we expect. We have struggles and difficulties that are still a part of everyday life. But Jesus Christ is much bigger than all of that. What makes the difference? Where does expectation meet reality? What is the truth that makes us free? Number three in your notes, write this. Finding freedom in biblical realities. Finding freedom in biblical realities. Look again, think again about the experience of the Apostle Paul in Romans. And this is how he concludes the passage where he describes the spiritual struggle that he had between, you know, his new nature and spiritual nature and the old man. Romans 7 verses 24 and 25, he says this, 
O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body, from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. Paul is saying, you know, in myself I'm wretched. I'm wretched. But my deliverance isn't up to me. My deliverance is up to God. It's up to Jesus Christ. I have deliverance through him. I can journey on loving and serving God from my heart. And yes, I'll fight sin in my flesh, but I, but I journey on because I know that Christ will deliver me. I know that Christ will help me. And until I see him, he's going to keep helping me and keep working on me. I'll be saved, but struggling and secure, but stumbling at times. Yes, we, we do that. We stumble at times. All of us do. Saved but struggling, secure but stumbling, accepted but maybe feeling spiritually awkward at times. The Apostle Paul basically says, I thank God for Jesus. I thank God that for, for, because of Jesus, I have, I have deliverance. Through Jesus, I have victory. We all need mercy because this is much bigger than us. Letter A in your notes, you can write this. We are saved, but we still, but we will, we still struggle. Letter A, we are saved, but we still struggle. Which of you doesn't struggle with your flesh? Which of you is not going to struggle with, with overcoming sin and, and so on? None of you. We all will. We are saved, but we still struggle. If you're a struggling Christian, can I tell you something? You're a normal Christian. You're normal. You're a normal Christian. We're in the same boat as the Apostle Paul, and it's a lifeboat. We are broken, sinful human beings, ravaged by a fallen, sinful world, stricken with the curse of sin. We've been pulled from the raging waters, unable to save ourselves, unable to sustain ourselves, desperate in every way for forgiveness and spiritual hope that is only found in the Lord Jesus Christ. We're journeying in safety to safety. We're journeying in safety to safety. We're safe. And we're saved, but we haven't yet arrived on shore. I'm glad that one day up there, I will be perfect. We read the verse a few weeks ago, but there's going to be some groanings and struggling, wondering at times why we're, we're not all that, that we ought to be. We groan and we struggle, wishing for the redemption of the body. I know I'm redeemed. I know in my soul, in my spirit, and so on, I've been redeemed. I'm saved. I'm a child of God. But this old body hasn't been redeemed yet. And the Bible speaks to the fact that we're waiting for the redemption of the body because now I still live in this sinful flesh body, sinful flesh nature. One day up there, he's going to give me a new body, a glorified body that will never sin again. No more struggle with the flesh. We're waiting for that. We're saved, but we still struggle. We still struggle. Arrival is certain, but the present life is still boisterous at times and filled with conflict. Letter B in your notes, write this. We are dependent in every way. Letter B, we are dependent in every way. If you ever start to thinking you don't need Jesus to live the Christian life, you're in trouble. We are dependent in every way on God's mercy and God's grace and our need of him to have victory. We can do nothing without him. Nothing without him. Many Christians wrongly see salvation as a faith decision, but then they see their spiritual growth or their sanctification as a do-it-yourself project. They may think, God said, I saved you now. Now get to work and make something out of yourself. And that's not the way it is. God saves us, and he's the one that can make something out of us. He's the one that can make something out of us. We wrongly see God's grace being like a delivery truck that had dropped off all the supplies that we need to work on ourselves, to make ourselves better. We wrongly see Christianity as a self-improvement project for which he provides us the raw material, but that's not the picture at all. We are dependent 100% upon Jesus Christ and his grace and his power before salvation, in salvation, after salvation. We need him. Every moment of the journey, we are dependent upon him. To have any victory, it depends upon him. We need him. We are God's workmanship. We are God's good work. He saved us and he's working on us. He's working on us. 
Ephesians 2 and verse 10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Even our obedient cooperation with the work that God is trying to do in our lives is simply us responding to God's grace. It's a response to God's grace in saving us and his, his desire to change us and make us into a new creature. It's God who does the work and it's God who wants all the glory. God who wants all the glory. Philippians 2 and verse 13 is, is an awesome verse. For it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. It's God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. God is working on us so that Christ be formed in us. The, the, the edges are very raw and rough when we get saved. Right? It's, it's like when we get saved that we're, we're, we're still this, this block of wood, if you will. And the Holy Spirit indwelling you and living in you is, begins working away on you with a chisel. The Word of God begins to work away on you like a chisel. I, I, some of you, I've told this before over the years, but um, when we started our church, we, we met a couple in Toronto. And this older man, he was an amazing woodworker. Amazing and he had some things that he did that, you know, were not these things from, from Dollarama where you take little pieces and put them together. He had taken things where he'd taken, you know, blocks of wood and, you know, things, from, you know, and done amazing woodwork to chip away and then to carve away. I don't know how many different tools that man had to use to just get everything so precise. And he made beautiful creations. It's only God that can do that in us. Christ can be formed in us. And we may seem like a pretty rough exterior block of wood when he saves us, but from the time you get saved until you get to heaven, he's going to keep working on you. Chiseling away, carving away, just trying to make your life more beautiful, to make you more like the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're, we're not to get frustrated with, I still feel like, okay, no, he's working on you. He's going to work on you. He's going to work on me until we get to heaven. We're dependent on him in every way. His grace is our motivation and sustainer for cooperating with him in what he wants to do in our lives. Let us see. The Christian life is not hard. It's impossible. The Christian life is not, not simply hard for you to do. It's impossible for you to do. You cannot live the Christian life on your own. Again, the Christian life is not hard, it's impossible. The Christian life is not a, a try harder life. It's a, it's a growing further life. It's a relationship, not a religion. It's a journey that you take with God, not a climb that you do for Him. It's an exercise in knowing Him, not your trying to win Him. If you belong to Jesus, then you have all of his heart, all of his love, all of his acceptance, and you always will. You could never earn any more than you already have. And that's why he calls it grace. Grace. God's riches at Christ's expense. Grace. Letter D in your notes write this. We are unconditionally accepted by Jesus. What a great thought. We are unconditionally accepted by Jesus. Uh, you know, as humans, we, we, we're prone to be very much conditional sometimes. Little children may at times be very conditional in their friendship. Well, I'll be your friend if you'll be my friend. <laughs> I'll, I'll give you this if you'll give me this. I'll love you if you'll love me. And you know what? Us big people, we're like that sometimes too. Sometimes we're very conditional. God is unconditional in his love for you. Nothing can change his love for you. You've accepted Jesus Christ. He's accepted you in the beloved. You're part of God's family. Nothing can change that. Praise the Lord for that. The Christian life is a relationship of unconditional acceptance and absolute dependence on him. It is not only a walk in which you are completely secure and entirely loved, but also a walk in which you are weak and vulnerable and absolutely dependent upon your Savior and His strength every step of the way. Jesus said that the truth will make you free. 
the truth will make you free. John chapter 8, verse 32. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. It's, it's not a religion with a grip on you, trying to squeeze you. No, it sets you free. Sometimes people just don't understand how, how liberating real Christianity is. Being born again, knowing Jesus as your Savior. It's wonderful. Truth releases you from some faulty expectations. It sets you free to be in a relationship on a journey where you'll struggle and fail, but you'll yield and you'll discover God's grace fresh and new every day. Ever hoping for the full and final rescue and redemption of the body. And we don't have to worry about it. We know that it's coming. Final rescue and glorification is God's absolute promise. You're just not there yet. I'm just not there yet. Remember that. Religion will leave you breathless, tired, frustrated, trying harder until you end up quitting. God is far away, it seems, and distant with his arms folded and he's, he's commanding you to, to get better and do this and do that. And you, you may nobly be pressing forward, alone, anxious, and exhausted. Eventually you'll stumble, we'll stumble, we'll struggle, we'll, we'll give up will falter under the weight of religion's demands if that's the way you've even viewed your Christianity. Beaten down and too weary to press forward, we resign ourselves to thinking we're an absolute failure. The accuser of the brethren tells us, he whispers to us that we're just a disappointment to God. We're a failure. God will never love us. God will never accept us. That's a, that's a lie from the devil. Don't believe it. It's the devil's lies. You're accepted. The devil may accuse you. Failure may scream into your conscience. Try harder. You'll never get this. Relationship is entirely different than religion. It's the opposite. Relationship welcomes you undeserving into close connection to God's heart and the warmth of his grace. By birth, you are loved. By grace, you are forgiven. By God's extravagant goodness, you are loved and you are safe and you are held and you are secure in his arms. All of your unrighteousness has been removed. He's imputed the, the, the righteousness of Christ onto your record. You're his child. All that you have to offer him is a broken, sinful life. He picks up all the pieces of our failed attempts and even maybe our, our attempt at religion and he tosses them aside and he carries us forward and he says, I've adopted you. I've made you my child. You belong to me now and nobody is ever going to take you away from me. I've adopted you. I've accepted you. I've chosen you. You know, in biblical days when a child was adopted into a family, that adoption could never be reversed. You're adopted. You're God's child. You cannot do anything to reverse it. You belong to Him. Galatians chapter 4, 4 and 5 says, But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sins. He came to redeem those that were trying to live under the law. And all they knew was failure because we can never live up to the law. We can never measure up. None of us can ever be sinless and perfect. And so he comes to us in our failing and in our sinfulness and our brokenness. And he redeems us and saves us. And when we receive Christ, he receives us and makes us his children. God invites you to step away from religion and enter into a relationship. Everything that we're going to study from this point and forward in the coming weeks and so on is going to help to educate us and strengthen us in that wonderful relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. If you really want to understand and enjoy real Christianity, never get too far from this thought of relationship, not religion. It's about a relationship, not a religion. That's what we have, something wonderful, if you've accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. If you haven't done that yet, I sure hope that you will. I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you. Let's go to the Lord. Let's pray. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you that we can study this, this wonderful truth. God, you, you desire a relationship with us. Not a religion with all kinds of demands upon us. Yes, yes, we understand you call us to live a holy life. But God, we understand that 
it's impossible to us have any victory and change in our life without you. Lord, we know it's only by your grace and mercy that you work on us and you make us more like Christ. God, I, I thank you for the Christian life and for the joy that we can have and the peace that we can have and the, and the hope and confidence that we have when we know you. Thank you for the purpose and meaning you've given to my life. Thank you for the value you've placed upon me. And my value is not determined by what anybody else thinks about me. My value is determined, Lord, because you love me. You created me, and now you've saved me. You made me your child. I belong to you, and Jesus belongs to me. I thank you, Lord, for your wonderful gift, your wonderful grace, your wonderful salvation. Grow us in your grace. Help us to understand that we need you, and we depend upon you. Help us, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.